Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby, and my guest today is none other than Dr. Paul Offit. Dr. Offit, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Brian. Thanks for asking. Oh, you're welcome. I think the last time we spoke was in September 2022. That show was memorable for me because it's the first time I've been referred to or lumped in with Nazis in the comment section. <laughs> it was a first for me. <laughs> so, well, Welcome to the game. Oh, thank you. I have a proper bio for you. Let me read that. Dr. Offit is a pediatrician, a professor of both pediatrics and vaccinology, and he is the director of the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He is an expert on vaccines, immunology, and virology, and co-inventor of the rotavirus vaccine, Rotatech. Dr. Offit is a member of the FDA Vaccines and Related Biological Products Committee, otherwise known as the Vaccine Advisory Committee, and he was recently elected a member of the American Philosophical Society, which was founded in 1743 by Benjamin Franklin. The American Philosophical Society promotes useful knowledge through excellence in scholarly research, professional meetings, publications, library resources, and community outreach. I mention that because Dr. Offit checks all of those boxes as he has published hundreds of papers in medical and scientific journals, speaks at both professional and public conferences, and is the author of 13 books, including Bad Advice, Why Celebrities, Politicians, and Activists Aren't Your Best Source of Health Information, Overkill, When Modern Medicine Goes Too Far, You Bet Your Life, From Blood Transfusions to Mass Vaccinations, The Long and Risky History of Medical Innovation, and his newest book is Tell Me When It's Over, an insider's guide to deciphering COVID myths and navigating our post-pandemic world, which is what we are going to talk about today. Okay, with that in mind, you were in our, on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. You were in our pediatrician at a children's hospital. You write op-eds in national publications as well as in professional medical journals. You appear on national broadcast networks, podcasts, and lest it be forgotten, you're also a father and a grandfather. And... You published two books during the pandemic. So those are a lot of different angles from which to view the last few years, inside and outside. So what was it like to write this book and look back at the last few years of COVID? It was cathartic. Um, I think what this book was for me was this contrast between two very different things. On the one hand, you had this virus, which raised its head after an animal to human spillover event in on uh, China in late 2019. By January of 2020, we isolated the virus, we sequenced it, so now you can make a vaccine. It's an unusual virus, has unusual biological and clinical characteristics. And, and despite that, using a technology, messenger RNA, that we had never used to make a vaccine before, in 11 months, fastest vaccine ever made, we did two huge clinical studies that showed the vaccine worked and was remarkably effective. Then, similarly, in the next uh, seven months or so, we were able to mass produce, which was not easy for this vaccine. I mean, lipid nanoparticles are not easy to mass produce. We mass produced, mass distributed, mass administered this vaccine in a country that didn't have an infrastructure for mass vaccinating adults. I think that period represented the most amazing medical and scientific accomplishment in my lifetime. But then we hit a wall. 70% of the country got vaccinated, but 30% refused, refused to be vaccinated, didn't trust us. They, they basically 300,000 people lost their lives unnecessarily because they didn't trust us. And that's really a large part of why I wrote this book. What happened? How had we lost the public's trust to the extent that they, they were willing to reject the vaccine at the expense of their own lives or their family's lives? All right, you just foreshadowed basically my entire Q&A here, which is great, because let me hit a, high, a couple of those high points. So the book's divided into three sections, uh, where we were, where we are, where we're headed. You covered some of that. I, I, there's something I really want to drill down that you mentioned there, origins, okay, because this has come up in uh, different, uh, different scenarios. So give me the insider's view. You, you touched on it, but specifically on cars, uh, SARS-CoV-2 origins. I mean, we, we went through this thing with uh, lab leak claims made by the Department of Energy and the FBI. Can you compare those with the actual evidence of wet market origins and spread? 
Right, it would be nice that when Christopher Wray testified in front of Congress representing the FBI and said that he thought there was credible evidence that this was a lab leak, that he actually prevent, presented one scintilla of credible evidence. Same with Department of Energy. They just sort of waved their hands and said, this, there's credible evidence. So what's the evidence that this was a, an animal to human spillover event? Um, the, there has been progressive deforestation that has allowed bats to live closer and closer to other mammals than ever before, which is why we had an animal to human spillover event in, 20, um, in 2002 with SARS-1, an animal to human spillover event in 2012 with MERS, and now this one. It occurred in the western section of the Hunan wholesale seafood market. There was a, there, all the original cases emanated from that one area. Number one. Number two is there was a picture done that was put on a, a, a website that was then quickly taken off of, of how all these mammals, you know, so dozens of mammals that were sold illegally, were all sort of gathered together in these unsanitary conditions in that section of the Hunan seafood market, including animals that can transmit this virus, like red foxes or raccoon dogs. And the, 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 the Chinese went in there, Chinese scientists went in there and did the kind of genetic studies looking at things like the cages uh, or the, the uh, materials that were used to slaughter the animals or materials that were used to brush the hair of the animals and found evidence of, of that virus in that area. So, so th th what you see is you see in that area exactly where you would expect a, an animal to human spillover event to occur, it occurred. There's actually a podcast done by three evolutionary biologists. Uh, Michael Warby, um, Chris Anderson, and Eddie Holmes called Decoding the Gurus, where for three hours, they go through all the data that shows that this was an animal to human spillover event. And so nonetheless, people don't believe it. Two thirds of the American public think that this was a lab leak. Um, and and the, the, the arguments that have been made for why it was a lab leak is they say, well, the, if you look at this virus, you can't find any evidence in nature of this spike protein. It's unique. Not true. It has been found in Laos and other countries. Number two, they say there's something called a furin cleavage site. There's a whole book written about this by Alicia Chan and Matt Ridley called Viral, where they say, look, this furin cleavage site is not in nature, but it is found in nature. So the only thing you have, what you have on one side is, is an animal to human spillover event, which happens all the time, right? I mean, we're always at risk of animal to human spillover events. AIDS was an animal to human spillover event that occurred from when SIV mutated, uh, simian immunodeficiency virus mutated to HIV uh, back in Cameroon in the 1930s. Um, and, and on the other side, on the lab leak side, all you have is innuendo and conspiracy. It's hard to watch. This is not a scientific controversy. It's a cultural controversy, but not a scientific controversy. It was interesting to me because the DOE said the evidence is of low confidence, yet the headlines came out most likely a lab leak. I don't know how those two... <laughs> work out together. But, and you also mentioned this picture that appeared on the internet briefly and that um, the spread started in the market. Can you explain that uh, epidemiologically? You know, you can actually pinpoint how the spread starts and expands from that location and it didn't from the lab? Right. So the lab is, is nine miles away from where this animal to human spillover event occurred. And it's on the other side of the river. So um, number one, Number two is if this was created in a laboratory, so, so what did they do? They created it in the laboratory and then they, they went nine miles and then distributed it in a place where you would exactly where you would expect an animal to human spillover event to occur. What are the odds? 10 million to one? There's a lot of places in Wuhan where this virus could have first originated if the, the person who created it in the lab wanted to do it that way. The other thing is that it really was a promiscuous virus. It wasn't in any sense hyper-targeted to the, uh, the human uh, um, binding receptor at all. In fact, there's dozens, probably three dozen different mammals that are susceptible to this virus. So one of the pundits that commented on this, I thought was perfect, was, um, you know, if this was created in the lab, it was created by an underachieving graduate student. Going on from the origins, um, you have a section on conspiracies, and I just want to touch briefly on that. Some people were really quick to jump on the bandwagon, and I mean, and this was pre-vaccine even, just coming up with the old trope that every vaccine, including COVID vaccines, are going to be a method of depopulation, and every doctor in the world is in on it. I'm kind of embarrassed to say that, but that, I mean, that's... That was one of the things that was said very bizarrely. All right, so as a vaccinologist, immunologist, can you give me the real history of, um, you know, brief history of vaccines and how they actually prevent illness? So the first vaccine was a smallpox vaccine created in the late 1700s. Um, 
And it was a um, it was an animal virus, a cowpox virus. It was similar enough antigenically so that immunization with this cowpox virus would pre prevent you from having human smallpox. So that was that was one technology, one strategy, which was use an animal virus to protect against a human virus. Um, and then then you had other strategies. So the rabies vaccine came about a hundred years later. Take the virus, kill it, whole virus, and kill it. That's what Louis Pasteur did, and that was created in the late eighteen hundreds. Then you had a variety of other strategies. Um, the yellow fever vaccine was a live, weakened form of the virus. So you take the virus, you cause it to be adapted to cells in which it normally doesn't grow. That weakens the virus. Not so weak that it doesn't induce an immune response, but, but um, uh, strong enough to be able to, uh, weak enough so that it doesn't cause disease. So that's the way not only yellow fever vaccine is made, measles, mumps, German measles, or rubella, the rotavirus vaccine, uh, one of the rotavirus vaccines, um, the chickenpox vaccine were all made that way. And then we, we, as we got better at protein purification, at, at recombinant DNA technology, then you started to have the single protein vaccines, like the hepatitis B vaccine, which is just one protein, or you have the, um, the human papillomavirus vaccine, which is just one of the viral proteins. And then with this, you moved into the next era of viral vaccines, which is the, the genetic era. You know, you have a genetic vaccine. You don't, you're not giving the whole virus. Or you're not giving a cold killed form of the virus. Or you're not giving a viral protein. You're giving the gene that codes for the viral protein. So then that gene that enters your cell, it's translated into the protein. So you make the protein. And I think that scared people. I think the word genetic scared people. Because when they hear that, they think, oh, my God, this could insert itself into my gene or some way alter my gene. And because I think we don't really have a great understanding of how these genetic vaccines work. You also uh, have a section in the book, uh, I think it's called The FDA Stumbles. So I like that you also acknowledge there were some missteps. I mean, stuff was unfolding in real time, right? So it's understandable. But the FDA stumbles, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, I think, I think in terms of trying to figure out why we lost trust, I, th I think part of it was that um, you, you, you learn as you go. I mean, you don't know everything at the beginning, so you're going to not get everything right initially. But part of it were unforced errors. So, so I'm going to go through sort of a couple unforced errors and then what I think was a, um, a learn-as-you-go moment. So um, the, the in April of 2020, so this is before you have anything, don't have vaccines, don't have monoclonals, don't have antivirals, um, the FDA authorized the use of hydroxychloroquine, an anti-malarial drug to treat or prevent COVID. And so that was... Um, not based on any information. There was no evidence that that was going to work. It was something that the Trump administration wanted. They were looking for a magic medicine to make this all go away. So they bought 30 million uh, uh, tablets of hydroxychloroquine, all for the purpose of, of making this virus go away. So uh, over the next few months, study after study showed that it didn't work to treat or prevent. Hydroxychloroquine didn't work to treat or prevent um, COVID. And so then three months later in June, the FDA withdrew that. That was not a good look for the FDA. I mean, the FDA is, is there to protect the public from pharmaceutical products that don't work or, or, or either, because either ineffective or unsafe. And they didn't do their job here. Their job is to protect the public from products that are unsafe or ineffective. And, and, and this was a product that was completely ineffective. And certainly, like any medicine, can be unsafe in that this hydroxychloroquine can cause um, uh, arrhythmias, heart arrhythmias, which can be fatal. So that shook the faith of many people, including me. I mean, I, I was now people were upset. They thought, OK, this is the same group that's about to, to authorize vaccines. Why should we trust them? It looks like the, the, the administration can twist the arm of the FDA to get what it wants. And so what ended up happening is a, a number of people, a number of states formed their own vaccine advisory committees. They didn't trust us. They didn't trust the FDA vaccine advisory committee. And um, I'd, I'd like to say, by the way, the hydroxychloroquine thing never came before our committee. That was just something the FDA decided on their own. And so then what happened was, remember, you had an election coming up. In the beginning of November, you had an election and, and Donald Trump, you know, pulled Stephen Hahn, the commissioner of the FDA, into his office and in an invective latent tirade said, I want this vaccine out before November. I, I want it out because I think it'll help my election. And if you were going to do the normal safety follow up, which is two months after the last dose, that took you into December after the election. And Hahn, to his credit, stood up here where he didn't really stand up on the hydroxychloroquine issue. He certainly stood up here and said no and put it on their website the next day. This is two months safety follow-up as always. 
Um, I actually wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying, calling it the October surprise. I didn't want an October surprise. And so fortunately that, that didn't happen. And, and we had a vaccine that clearly was effective. I think there were a couple other missteps. I think there was a misstep in um, July of 2021. So now the vaccine had been out for seven months. There were um, celebrating the July 4th holiday were thousands of men who went to uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts to celebrate. Most were vaccinated, about 80% were vaccinated, but nonetheless, there was an outbreak. 346 men got COVID, four were hospitalized. That's a hospitalization rate of a little over 1%. That's great. That's a vaccine working well. A moment to celebrate. That's the goal of this vaccine. Keep you out of the hospital. Keep you from having severe disease. The remaining 342 had asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infections, which the CDC in their publication about this outbreak labeled breakthrough illnesses. Breakthrough. Wrong word. Breakthrough implies failure. This wasn't a failure. It was a remarkable success, success a chance to celebrate, and it created the notion that the vaccine wasn't working. So, so you, for example, Ron DeSantis, when he was on the stump later, would say, you know, the CDC told you this vaccine was going to work, but it didn't. And that's what he was referring to. That even though you got the vaccine, you could still get a mild illness, which of course had to happen. This was a short incubation period mucosal infection. Antibodies in the circulation aren't going to last more than four or six months. And then you're going to be susceptible to mild disease. But you still have memory immune cells, which will protect you against severe disease for a long time, which is basically what we're seeing. So that was a unforced error. I think in August of 2021, when President Biden stood up in front of the country and said, as of the week of September 20th, we are going to offer a third dose of vaccine. Remember, this was still two dose time for everyone over 12 years of age. Like, what? I mean, where did that come from? All the evidence we had was the vaccine was still working very well, really up through the end of December in protecting against severe disease. And so that went to our committee on an emergency meeting, um, September 17th, three days before this was supposed to launch. And we voted no, because there was no evidence that you had to do that. And same, the CDC a week or so later, also the advisory committee voted no. So now you have the president of the United States saying, we're going to give a third dose to everybody. And you have the advisory committee saying no. So people were confused. What does it mean to be protected? So that was a, another unforced error. And then there's the learning as you go. I mean, the bivalent vaccine wasn't a bad idea. It wasn't any better than what we had. Um, it, was a, it, it wasn't a mistake. I mean, boosters still boosted, but it just wasn't any better than the monovalent vaccine. And I think you started to lose some scientists there because the scientists that were working on this knew that this wasn't any better. Um, the two publications in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that it wasn't any better. There have been three clinical studies showing it wasn't any better. And so don't, just don't say it's better. And so I think we have trouble acknowledging that we learn as we go because the fluidity of science is disconcerting. It is. People want to believe you know everything you need to know now, even when you don't. It's. A, I guess I'm off on a tangent here, but it's interesting you mentioned that um, how the vaccine was it was termed breakthrough um, because of some mild cases. And just a couple of weeks ago, I saw in the MMWR that it's 54 percent effective against asymptomatic. But at least in the next sentence, they said, but the real point is uh, severe illness. Uh, but nonetheless, we're studying asymptomatic. Yet the headline that comes out in the papers is 54% against asymptomatic. And what does that really tell me, though? I need the other part of it. I don't know if you want to comment on that, but. The goal of this vaccine is to prevent severe illness. The CDC knows that. And so, so for example, look at the way that they're promoting flu vaccine this year. Wild to mild. We get the vaccine. So basically you can tame the virus. So it doesn't cause a wild disease, meaning a severe disease, but rather only causes a mild disease. And, and I just think we created this unrealistic expectation of what these vaccines can do. And it's, it, I think in that sense, we lost the public trust, especially because we were mandating vaccines. You were saying you had to get a vaccine and, or you couldn't go to work or you couldn't go to a sporting event or you couldn't go to a restaurant or religious ceremony, whatever. And people are, wait, they're, they're forcing me to get this vaccine and now it doesn't work because I still got you know, a mild illness or a moderate illness. And I think we just uh, didn't explain right from the beginning what, what, what to expect. Because when we, could, we, the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, reviewed data in December of 2020, that vaccine was 95% effective against mild, moderate, and severe disease. Both vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer. Why so good against mild disease? Those were three-month studies. Those people had just gotten their second dose. Those, so they still had high levels of antibodies. But six months later, you saw the protection against severe disease was 
holding up well by July of 2021, but protection against mild disease had dropped to 50%, which is exactly what you would have expected. We should have explained that right from the beginning, that, that don't expect protection against mild disease for long, because that's not the way these viruses work. And I think we just got caught up in that. We're still caught up in that. There's a lot more in the first section where we were, a lot of history, interesting medical history, too, that you tied in there. We briefly spoke about the vaccines in general and how they actually help human flourishing. Uh, the population in the world is not declining in, in case no one had noticed that. Um, but where are we now? So we're about three and a half years out from when the mRNA vaccines at least were first authorized. And I like, you know, you recognize that there are adverse events from the vaccines. Now that we're three and a half years out, talk about adverse events from COVID. So people are still walking that line. Well, I'm going to take my chance and get, you know, there's adverse events from vaccines. I'll take my chance with COVID. Give me the risk-benefit analysis uh, there. What's the, from both ends? Right, so there's still, uh, I haven't seen the, the data today, but as of like last week, there were still roughly 2,000 people dying a week of COVID. And, and, and so then the question becomes, who's dying? Who's getting hospitalized and who's dying? Because that's who you want to protect. And the answer is generally four high-risk groups, people who are elderly, and as Rochelle Walensky, God bless her, said, the elderly, elderly, Meaning, if you look at the studies here, it was like people over 75. It studies in England it was people over 80. So the really, the really elderly, which is good because I'm not quite there yet. Um, and then people who were immune compromised, people who had chronic medical conditions like heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, uh, obesity, et cetera, that put them at higher risk of severe disease, and, and pregnant people or other people who are at highest risk. So target them. And I think um, what we've done now is we've likened this campaign to flu. So every year um, we've moved more from booster dosing to yearly campaign, which is what we do with flu. But, but SARS-CoV-2 is not influenza virus. And I think that, that um, if the goal is to keep people out of the hospital, those who are at highest risk out of the hospital, those who are most likely to be hospitalized, then we should do what every other country in this world does, which is vaccinate high-risk groups. We in Canada are the only two countries in this world that say vaccinate everybody over six months of age. So, so that too is, I think, worthy of discussion. In your section on misinformation, I'm just, I don't know, I wanna ask this question. You can pat, bypass it if you want, but as a, from sitting where you were on the inside, when you saw someone that should know better coming out and saying just crazy things, like, you know, this, there's no excess deaths, it's all the vaccine caused deaths, or, I mean, these are people that should know better, like evolutionary biologists, and uh, how did you process that? Can I ask that question without mentioning names? <laughs> sure. No, I, I think we're living in this kind of post-truth world where people just, you know, declare their own truths, including scientific truths, and including scientists. So, for example, you'll have Marty Macri, you know, a well-established uh, researcher at uh, Hopkins in the School of Public Health, testifying in front of Congress that the lab leak is, is, is a no-brainer. Obviously, it was a lab leak because there's a lab there, and, you know, and there's an outbreak in the same city. So it must be that. Um, or you have people like Robert Malone, you know, who was an MD who, who did important scientific work in the late 1980s, looking at how you could inject an animal with messenger RNA and get them to make a protein. That was really groundbreaking work that he did. Um, he, he, did he didn't really create this vaccine. There were other steps that had to happen for there to be a vaccine, but he certainly was an important scientist going up in front of Congress saying that DNA fragments in an mRNA vaccine can cause, insert themselves into your DNA and cause cancer and cause uh, autoimmune disease. And this, the, the, the fingerprints of the CIA are all over this. It's hard to watch. It really is hard to watch. And Peter McCullough is a, he's a cardiologist who gets out there and says the spike protein is toxic. So it's like, I've seen the enemy and they are us. And, um, and what do you do? Because if you're just a, a you know, if you're a member of the general population, you don't necessarily have a scientific or medical background. What you're being asked to do is to pick someone to trust. And it's unclear who you should trust. Pandemic of the unvaccinated. That's where this misinformation has led us, correct? Um, because people pick who they trust. And if they trust someone that's telling them that the vaccine is worse than the disease, that's a problem. But what was it, really interesting, you have a section on that in the book. What was bizarre to me is the people with organ transplants, they're on the list, but they refuse to get vaccinated. So they're trusting a medical establishment to save their lives with an organ transplant, yet somehow that same establishment is gonna kill them or worse with a vaccine. Can you, I mean, you wrote about this, you didn't quite take it from that angle, but what did you find out about those cases? Okay, here's the part of this pandemic that upset me the worst. 
in 2020 and then in, in early 2021, by now you had a vaccine in 2021, um, there were a lot of people who chose not to get that vaccine. Now, we, our hospital, like many hospitals, was overwhelmed by this virus. We had three floors of people with COVID. It was, it was so bad that we were working double shifts. I mean, it was all hands on deck. You had trouble taking care of all those patients. And our, our emergency department was flooded. I mean, you, you had people who normally wouldn't have been assigned to go to the emergency department to go down there just to handle this onslaught of cases. Um, and there were excess deaths because of it, because we because hospitals um, were overwhelmed by this virus. So not only did you have trouble taking care of COVID, you had trouble taking care of your other patients. We suspended elective sur surgeries because we were overwhelmed. So, so when the vaccine was available and people could get the vaccine, and then didn't get the vaccine and came to our hospital for care, that really upset me. Because here, just as you say, they were perfectly willing to, to um, avail themselves of the care of, of modern medicine in a hospital, but they weren't willing to get a vaccine. And, and it just uh, I just saw it as enormously selfish. All right, let's jump ahead. Where are we now? Where, so we, we did, so where were we? Where are we? Where are we headed? All right, so I've been vaccinated, I get COVID. Uh, what about treatments? What treatments are available now? Right. I think that's a really important point, because I think if you look at who's dying, um, again, it's people in high risk groups. And, and one of the reasons that they they're, they're all four of the groups that I mentioned do share one thing in common, which is they all may not make a very good immune response. I mean, my mother's 95 years of age. She got a covid vaccine this year. I suspect she probably doesn't make a, a great immune response. I mean, she's her immune response is fairly senescent at this point. Um, but if you look at people who are getting hospitalized or dying, a, a fairly large percent never took an antiviral. And if you take an antiviral in the first few days of illness, you dramatically lessen your chance of going on to develop severe disease. And I think we're, we're not good about that. And Paxlovid is the most commonly uh, used antiviral because it's given by mouth and it works very well. The problem is it has a lot of drug-drug interactions. But I think what, what physicians really need to do is that it's okay to have drug-drug interaction. Just stop giving that dr other drug for a few days. I mean, I, it's always a matter of relative risk. I think if someone's in a high-risk group and they have COVID and they're at high risk of going on to develop severe, arguably fatal disease, how important are those other drugs for the few days that you're, you're going to be giving Paxlovid or the five days you're going to be giving Paxlovid? And I think we're not good at that. And I think there's a lot of unnecessary deaths because we're not good at giving antivirals early in illness. COVID, it's here to stay, right? It's not going to get wiped out. It's a coronavirus. This is something we're going to have to live with. So where are we? Or masking in crowds or at the hospital? I mean, you're at a children's hospital, so I, I know your hospital mandates the flu vaccine every year, right? So I don't know if they're going to mandate the... Is it going to be a booster COVID every year? I don't know. what. Oh, you're not going to mandate that one. Okay. What about masking You know that in, in the hospital or in crowds? So in our hospital, you mask. Um, that's true. Um, we, did, we didn't... Yeah, we have a yearly flu vaccine. We didn't, we didn't have a yearly uh, mandate for COVID vaccines because for the same reason that I talked about before, I don't think everybody needs a yearly COVID vaccine. I think just those people who are in high-risk group needs it, need it. And we certainly educate people in our hospitals to who the high-risk groups are. We encourage vaccination, but we don't mandate it for COVID. We spoke earlier about um, the Department of Energy, the FBI, um, and this is, goes under where we are heading. I was kind of interested in surveillance in general. I know there's flu surveillance because my, in graduate school, my epidemiology professor, prior to teaching, she was on the DOD. She ran like the flu for surveillance program for years, right? So I also assumed in the back of my mind that people are watching out for novel virus outbreaks. Um, you don't write about it in the book, but I'm wondering if you have any insight into if there is a surveillance program for that or, and if how early people noticed this kind of weird thing happening in China. There must've been signs like chatter, mobilization of hospitals or something? Yes, I, I think that's a really important point. There'll be another pandemic. I mean, there was a pandemic in 2002, a pandemic in 2012. Now there's this pandemic, 2019, all coronaviruses. Let's assume there'll be another pandemic. Um, how will we know when it's, when it's coming? Because we need to know when it's coming. And we also need to know, and this is what bothers me about this whole lab leak theory nonsense, is that we need to understand what situation, what, what, what situations allow this kind of animal to spill over, to human spillover event to occur so that it doesn't occur again. I mean, I think China was culpable here for a few reasons. One, because they were selling a lot of mammals illegally. 
they were doing it in unsanitary conditions. And, and you know, and they, they also sell bats. I mean, you know, fried bats and bat soup. I mean, they, they um, have bats as part of what, what, uh, what they sell there. And so there are risks there. And, and what they didn't do is they didn't allow an international team of scientists to come in there immediately when something was happening. We had to depend on a whistleblower to say there is a virus circulating in China that's causing an unusual pneumonia that's killing people. We, we had to depend on that whistleblower who ultimately died, actually, of, of the virus. It shouldn't come to that. I, I think these countries have to be open their doors to international teams of scientists to any time this thing starts to arise, you quickly go there and allow people to kind of gather the information that, that they need to, to, in this case, isolate the virus early. And, and that didn't happen. China was culpable here. And I think in many ways, China's xenophobia, their unwillingness to admit that this had all started there, gives birth to those kind of conspiracies. It makes it easier to think there's a conspiracy. All right, let's bring it home now. I, I'm sorry to ask this, but I have to, because it's out there. It's just, again, one of these bizarre things. Measles, measles, measles. Here, there, and everywhere, right? So outbreaks in 11 states here in the United States. High numbers of vaccine exemptions, right? We're seeing headlines in medical journals, like despite safe and effective vaccines, measles cases and deaths increase worldwide from 2021 to 2022. And then just recently, there's this bizarre letter from the Florida Surgeon General that, you know, even exposed, whatever, do what you want. I, I'm sorry, I paraphrase there. You can say what his, he actually said. But it, it's, you know, basically, if you've been exposed, go about your business as usual. It's up to you. All right. I may misrepresent. Misrepresent that. Misrepresent that. So you can correct me. But anyway, what's your prediction for where this ends? I think the measles outbreaks are, in many ways, or cases, or in many ways, a direct consequence of what just happened with COVID. Because I think what you're seeing is um, a real um, backlash on mandates. I think we leaned into a libertarian left hook. So now, uh, up to 35 percent of parents saying they don't think there should be school mandates. Period. Two is that the CDC put out a, uh, a publication last November looking at immunization rates in kindergartens, kindergartners. And to, to a greater extent than ever before, parents are choosing either a, a, a non-medical exemption, either a philosophical or religious exemption, to not vaccinate their children. So you have those two things. You have now more and more children who are at risk, and you're starting to see these measles cases. And measles should worry you. One case of measles should worry you. It is the most contagious of the vaccine-preventable diseases. It has a contagious index, meaning the so-called R naught. How many people would you infect during a day if you uh, were contagious and everybody you came in contact with was susceptible? With COVID, the, the contagious index is around two to three. Same for flu. For measles, it's 18. You don't have to have direct contact with somebody with measles. You just have to be in their airspace within two hours of them being there. It's an aerosolized disease. And I think... People don't get this. And I, I really do fear that, that we're going to um, going to see this tip over where you're going to see a thousand cases or two thousand cases. And at that point, you know, with this virus, which has a mortality rate of 0.1 percent, meaning one per thousand will die, you could start to see children dying again. I don't that's not going to happen this year, I think, because we're already at the end of February. And there's one thing that stops measles. And it's not, I, I lived through the 1991 Philadelphia measles outbreak when we had 1,400 cases and nine deaths. And for all our vaccinating down to six months of age, all our having compulsory vaccination, actually, for those uh, religious groups that were choosing not to vaccinate their children who, who were the epicenter of the outbreak, um, the, the one thing that really stopped that outbreak was spring. So it's a winter disease. I think if we move into spring, I think you'll see a debate, but it'll be back next year. All doctors know this, right? Even surgeon generals, they know the R naught of measles. They know about that. Well, just what, what what's with this? Do what you want. I, I guess you probably can't comment on that. It's just happy to comment on it. Okay, not a problem. Um, well, first of all, we have a United States Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, who understands this quite well and has been very good and active about explaining it. Um, there are only four states, to my knowledge, that have state surgeon generals. Um, and so Florida is one of them. Dr. Joseph Ladapo is a state surgeon general. He has appeared on anti-vaccine podcasts, virulent anti-vaccine podcasts. He put out a missive that, you know, DNA fragments in vaccines or, you know, inserting themselves into your DNA and can cause cancer and autoimmune disease. He put that out there, which makes me think he has no idea about how these small DNA fragments are in many biologicals. Um, they're in the measles vaccine, the mumps vaccine, the rubella vaccine, the varicella vaccine, the rotavirus vaccine. They're always going to be DNA fragments because there were cells to begin with. 
But remember, we eat foreign DNA all the time, assuming you live on this planet and eat anything made from plants or animals. And that is in your circulation. You can detect that DNA there. And it, it doesn't hurt you because, first of all, it's, it generally doesn't get out of the cytoplasm. If it enters your cell, your cytoplasm has innate immune mechanisms and enzyme to completely destroy it. And then it has to get across the nuclear membrane, which is where you know your DNA resides in the nucleus, which is very difficult. It's virtually impossible in a non-dividing cell. And then it has to insert itself into your DNA, which requires things like integrases that it does. Now, also, there's not an oncogene. I mean, which is to say a gene that's associated with cancer in any of these products. So how can it cause cancer? It's not possible that it can cause cancer. And it's, it's, it's hard to explain that to the general public. It is. I, you, you know, I was on CNN with Brianna Keeler and was asked that question about commenting on Dr. Joseph Ladapo's notion that, that uh, these mRNA uh, vaccines that contain small fragments of DNA don't cause cancer. And I tried in the four minutes that you have to explain the science of that, because I think you have to explain the science. Because if you don't do that, and you say, look, vaccines are tested for safety and, and we're not saying that. You're just saying, trust me. And I do think you have to try and explain the science, even though it's difficult, uh, to, I think, to, get, uh, to, to explain it simply. All right. Dr. Paul Offit, thank you so much. The book is Tell Me When It's Over, An Insider's Guide to Deciphering COVID Myths and Navigating Our Post-Pandemic World. I found it a really informative read divided into the three sections where we are. I'm sorry, where we were, where we are, where we're heading, snippets of medical history, the founding of the FDA, and uh, the roots of anti-vaccination and vaccine development. So I think it's really a book for everyone. I mean, even if, if you were a hydroxychloroquine adherent or not, I mean, there's a great section on the rise and fall of it. And, and you talk about how science and research is done or should be done. We talked about the lab leak. If you're confused about that, it, you're detailed with uh, resources that you point to. It's just a really good book if you're serious about understanding what happened, why, and can set aside any of your preconceptions. So um, I suggest everybody get this book. Sorry, I don't mean to sell it for you, but libraries and schools and people should, should get this book. All right. Let me ask you, though. So this book, I guess you were done last June, so and then it takes months to come out. What are you working on now? Well, something we alluded to previously, it, 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 there's a Wikipedia site for this called Nobel Prize Disease, which is um, there's a series of sort of Nobel Prize winners who, who do like crazy things. I mean, so he, these, you know, it's people who win the Nobel Prize are generally pretty smart, pretty good scientists. Um, if you take somebody like Luc Montagnier, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering that HIV was the cause of AIDS, he then believes that uh, autism is a bacterial disease. So he sets up a clinic in China treating children with autism with antibiotics. And there's a lot of examples of that. And, and with, there's a growing psychological literature, psychiatric literature, showing that people who are really smart are actually more susceptible to biases, false beliefs, and conspiracies, which in many, many ways may explain some of the, the sort of well-known scientists who get up in front of the public and say things that are, are completely non-science based. No, I look forward to that book because I, I kind of thought about that as I was reading through your book and the Didier Raoul thing where... I mean, you can be wrong, right? <laughs> that was its problem. And uh, like Linus Pauling and vitamin C, you could be wrong. Just get over it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wrong all the time. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> so Dr. Paul Offit, I greatly appreciate your time here. I think it's been a fun and informative conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Take care. Good seeing you. Thanks. You too. Stay well.